Hello, English 215 Appalachian Literature students. Uh, this is Dr. Martin again, and I thought I'd give you a brief rundown of the story you read for today, because it's not an easy one, or the one you read for this week, The Haunt of Chil Chilowee, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's not a name I know that well. The Haunt That Walks Chilhowee, or Chilowee, which I think it is, um, by Mary Murphy. And uh, I'm going to be brief about this because this is this is a short story that has um, some local color fiction, and I want you to kind of focus on your own translation of her work this week for your weekly post. But the thing I wanted you to get first from from this piece would be Mary Murphy overall. Uh, she is our first Tennessee writer, uh, Mary Murphy. If you've driven through Tennessee, you might see signs for Murfreesboro. It is a family name, and she is well-known in the area. She is a local color. What I mean by that is she covers local region, local topography, that is landscape, and uses local dialect as well. But Murphy is a common name in Tennessee. If you drive through it, you will see, uh, probably see, at least towards the central eastern part of the state, places named after her. Um, Something really interesting about her, uh, and then we'll get to, to the heart that walks Chil Chilowee, um, is that she wrote under a pen name of as a man, Charles Egbert Craddock. And the reason she did that is probably what you already guess. It would be easier to publish as a man in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So she created a false authorial persona. It was eventually found out who she was, Mary um, Mary Murphy, Mary Noalis Murphy, that's her middle name. And so um, literary scholars know who she was, and that came out uh, during her lifetime. But she did publish as a man in order to get her local color fiction of Tennessee and the Great Smoky Mountains out there into the public eye. All right, so here's what I, I want you to do for The Heart That Walks Chilowee. So you're translating a passage of dialect. And, and what you should probably note is that she uses very formal English for her narrator, a third person narrator who's inter introducing us to these Tennessee mountain folk. And then she uses intense uh, dialect for their actual speech. This is very, very difficult dialect. And I, I've studied Southern dialect and fiction and, and hers is incredibly difficult to get through. So much of the story, whatever you're translating, whatever page I've assigned to you, will deal with um, country customs regarding haunts or haunts, um, uh, courting practices, um, local customs, including chickens. This is a rural culture in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So, and, and different characters as well, Peter Giles, Tom, Claire C., um, all of these characters will will be intertwined within the work. But if you note her dialect, that's going to be the hard part, number one. Number two is connecting to the larger story, and that's what I wanted to use this time to talk to you about. So the larger narrative of, is this. Um, a young man named Tom is courting, wanting to date Claire C. And he comes over at night, so he's, he's there on the second evening, and he has brought some chickens and was interested in courting her through chickens, right? It's a rural culture. So we've got that, that element of it. Um, and while they're doing that, they bring up this issue of a haunt. And a haunt would be a country way. This is southern white um, dialect and culture, right? But a haunt would be, what, what do we call it in Louisiana folklore? It would be a haunt, a ghost. Um, a haint, I've heard it, I think, before as well. And they say there's there's a figure that's been seen at night under uh, moonlit skies, and it's going around kind of the, the cove or um, uh, the glen where they live um, near Chilowee. And they see it through the moonlight. It's the, the ghost or the haunt that haunts that area. And so you've got the courtship narrative with Tom and Clarice, and then you've got the haunt narrative, but the heart is actually an escaped fugitive named Reuben, who um, one of the main characters is going to try to take care of as you get to the end of it. So what I want you to note is that as is often in Mary Murphy's work, and In the Tennessee Mountains is probably her most famous work, it's from the 1880s, um, 
there's often there's sometimes a supernatural figure that you found find out humorously is just a person. Um, it, another one of her stories has someone like on the bluff of a mountain. They can't figure out who it is, but it's just a, it, it's mistaken as a haunt or a ghost. Um, same thing with the the, the haunt that walks Chiloe. So we've got the the courtship story and you've got the haunt story, the discovery. Clarcy goes and brings food to the haunt. And basically, that's how it's discovered that it's Reuben who is running away from the law. There was a, a shooting or something like that. And he's going to live with one of the main characters for the duration of the, the story thereafter. But there, there's the idea that the two stories kind of coincide. He, that Hart interrupts the courtship. Um, and she, she basically has to go at night and is 